I struggled with finding my place to be and my people. Mm. You know, I didn't have my people. I, the people that I surrounded myself with and the culture that I was in didn't celebrate me or what the potential I was hopefully bringing, right? Welcome to the Winners Find a Way show. I am your host, Trent Clark, CEO of Leadershipity, serial entrepreneur, international speaker. But most people know me because I spent over 12 years in professional baseball with the Detroit Tigers, Cleveland Indians, and Los Angeles Angels, appearing in three World Series as a coach before I was the age of 33. Our Winners Find a Way show is all about how the 1% have found a way to overcome those challenges when faced with with losses and losing, winners find a way. I love the quote from the Four Disciplines of Execution book written by Christmas Chesney and Sean Covey. The quote goes, winners, when shown data that they are losing, find a way to win. Won't you join us and discover for yourself how you can win too? Welcome to episode number three and the three minute rule with Brent Penvedek, a good friend of mine, Hollywood film director and TV producer. Brent has actually pinnacled the success in Hollywood as a pitch man. He is an author with his book, The Three Minute Rule, and he is a consultant to many highlights of this episode. You will not want to miss how he talks about chasing the ideas of some sort of success, realizing how people that surround you help you find your way to the top the exceptional skill, and how having delusional optimism helps him overcome challenges. Going to be a great show. Hi, this is Trent Clark, and welcome to the Winners Find a Way show. I'm super excited to welcome my guest today, Brant Pinvidic, and we got lots of ground to cover. Super excited about everything that's going on right now uh, today with Brant Pinvidic, who is a Hollywood producer. Man, this guy's an author. He's 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 done it all. I, I love uh, Brant's take on it. I've actually had Brant on another one of my shows in the past, so you know we got some we got some ground to cover up. We got all sorts of fun stuff. So I'm really looking forward to it. Brant is currently. Uh, on the road again, you know, uh, tooling the world in an RV, which is pretty impressive. So for him to join us, not easy. So he goes live in his RV studio, maybe. I'm not sure where he's at. So Brant, tell me, where are you in the world right now, man? Right now I'm in Destin, Florida, and we are packing up in the next one hour and 12 minutes. And we are heading into Clearwater and Tampa area. And then we're going to go all the way down to way down to Key Largo. I got a big executive summit I'm doing down there. And then we're going all the way back up to Maine. And then when we're done there, we're going to head into the middle of the country and go all through that area. And we'll end up somewhere back in California by the end of oh September. <laughs> by the end of September, you know, sometime yeah. back then, like get, get the kids in school or something. You know, <laughs> like we'll see. Yeah, they might be exactly. remote learning still. Who knows? So. Let's um let me let me give you a couple highlights about Brant, my special guest yeah. today. I'm super excited about this. So award-winning film director, veteran television producer, C level sales and presentations coach. I mean, you coach all these executives, and the names are countless. Named to the Hollywood Reporter's 30 most powerful reality TV sellers, widely recognized as one of the greatest creative sellers in Hollywood. So that's pretty awesome. So we have the three-minute rule, which is the author of it. We're gonna talk about that. Man, just taking the life of life, business, and storytelling lessons developed a Hollywood career to a new level. Um, And now you've uniquely bridged the entertainment industry and the business community. So, wow. Welcome, Brant. How are you doing, my man? I'm doing great, buddy. Really, I'm rocking and rolling. So, it's a great place. Yeah, it's been amazing. I mean, I'm, yeah, it's, it's been really good. Been good so far. All right, real good. Let's talk a little bit about your why. Let's talk a little bit of why. We on this show, we talk a little bit about the things that got us knocked down somewhere along the line, right? And maybe some of the listeners don't recognize is like, you know, you're down, you're out, you're not feeling great. Man, has successful people ever gone through hard times? Like, or has it always just been easy? Like, so as you tell so tell us the why, why you come on the show and talk a little bit about your history and your story. You know, listen, I think my why has always been trying to find my place, right? Uh, I grew up in Canada, not a great home for entrepreneurs, not the same culture as you have here in the United States. And I think that I struggled with finding 
my place to be and my people, as I, as I'll say on stage when I talk about this, but mm. you know, I didn't have my people. I, it, the, the people that I surrounded myself with and the culture that I was in didn't celebrate me or what the potential I was hopefully bringing. Right. And so that was yes. difficult for me to reconcile growing up. And I was always looking for something bigger, better, bolder. I was very immature. I had sort of a shortcut guy's mentality. I always wanted to find the shortcut, never wanted to do all the work. Like when you combine all that, it was just like, <laughs> it left me short of success more often than I expected. Right. And nothing I did worked well. It all looked good on paper. I could create the ideas. I had great vision, blah, blah, blah. But the truth was, is that I just was not an executor and I couldn't put things together that made people that, that made me a success until I came to the United States. And so my why mm. started to evolve. Like truly, I just wanted to be accepted and find some modicum of success. And then when that happened, it was an overwhelming feeling and it sort of unlocked the other elements of my life where I was able to be the husband I wanted, the, the father I wanted, the friend I wanted, all of these things yes. that I wanted to be all my life. When I was free from my own sort of trying to figure out what's next and how I get there, I started to become better at that. And as my success grew, I sort of kept focusing on that side of things. Um, and that's how I sort of found myself here today. That's awesome. I love that. You know, um, I just, I, we have a fellow rock star Canadian entrepreneur coming on the show, female, just badass. Allison Hodson's coming on. And I heard her talk about this as a Canadian entrepreneur and world beater. She said, you know, I'm sitting in a meeting in New York and there's, there's 17 people in front of me and I got a meeting starting in 12 minutes. And I'm looking at the Starbucks line going, no way. Because back in Alberta, if there's three people working or if, you know, if there's 10 people working and three people in the store, I might be 25 minutes. <laughs> right. And she's like, there's no way. And she's like, in three and a half minutes, I'm out of that Starbucks with my product, you know, like rolling. There's an urgency and a level. And is that is that part of the way that played into Brant and Pinvidic's mojo? Because you're, you're an energy guy, man. Like, I feel it every time I'm with you and we're talking. Like, yeah. you are bringing it. Well, I think, again, it stems from my, like, I really wanted to be I really wanted to be successful. I wanted to to win at something. I wanted to be good at something. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be respected, like growing up. That was a huge, gigantic push. And then for me, when I got to Hollywood, the personality and the making friends and the connecting with people and being you know, bright and energetic and happy and all these things were part of the persona that you naturally, that I naturally sort of cultivated because I was in a place of, of happiness and acceptance and all of these things. Right. So it sort of snowballed on itself where that became my way of feeling connected and successful is like, I would, I, you know, my big personality and I reach out to people and I make friends easily and all of these things, it, it started to be like, mm -hmm. a, like the, almost like the drug that like gave me the dopamine I needed to get through crappy mm. times. And I find that during this trip where I'm on, on the road right now, you know, and we're going to all 48 States and my main mission is just to meet everyday Americans doing everyday things, fun and interesting people. And I find that being yeah. able to connect with people quickly, share stories, share experiences, make bonds is like an incredible life skill. And I think that, so that energy and yeah. all that sort of blended together in a town that really celebrates that. That's awesome. So tell me, um, before we keep moving, we're going to talk a lot about your Hollywood stuff, yeah. but um, before, where can they find you? Where can people find you? They're looking for you I'm, right now. I want to have brand pivot, come I'm to easy. talk to my company, anything, but where can they find you? That's not quite as easy, but uh, I'm easy to get a hold of. I love to do stuff. With people. <laughs> so I'm at, at Brant Pinvidic on any of the socials. You can go to brantpinvidic.com and get all of there, or you can go to three minute rule.com and you can find me there. Uh, easy to connect. So love it. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about. Um, give us a few samples. You come into Hollywood. You're known as the high sales leader. I mean, you've sold and produced these big time shows. So give us like four of your big shows, so everybody knows. Pranvidic. This is the guy that puts this on TV, right? Like this is how it all started, right? 
Yeah, as I said, it all depends on who, what you mean by who put it on TV, right? I've, I've well, done yeah, that yeah, my yeah, entire yeah, okay. yeah, it, just depends, it, <laughs> it just depends who I'm talking to. Like, I'll take credit for anything, you know, like my company <laughs> first season of MasterChef with Gordon Ramsay, which to which yeah. I had a next to nothing to do with, right? Yes, I was the president of the company and it was great for our company and we were in the midst of it and Gordon and I, whatever, that's all great. Yes. But I didn't sell the show. It was a format yeah. from Australia. You know what I mean? It was working with Fox, the people in the company that were there yeah. day to day. And it just depends, like if that if that makes me uh, bigger and better in that moment, yeah. I'd be like Master Chef. That's good. Um, but yeah, the yeah. real, I mean, the Bar Rescue is my big. That's sort of the big claim to fame now. It's probably one of the most popular shows out there. Um, my company did the yes. Big Loser, Extreme Makeover, Weight Loss Edition was a big one. So you know, I had a really good run mm. in the reality side of the business, and you know, like hundred, you know, it was a yeah. There's a lot of shows, a lot of TV shows that I that I did. So it was a good run. That's cool. So let's let's pivot because you touched on this a little bit as a Canadian, right? And growing yeah. up and finding your way. Tell us tell us the most impactful pivot point you had as this kid when you knew, like, hey man, I, I know what I want. I think <laughs> I'm destined for it. Like I'm ready to lead at the top levels of business, especially this business. Like, um, you know, so so many people would want to be at the top levels of the business, and we'll get into that. Like careful what you wish yeah. for later. Right. But like, right. but like, let's talk about that kid and you're going for it. What was, what was one thing that was a big pivot for you in that young age? You know, I think at a young age, I didn't really have a good pivot point, right? It was more of a chase point. I was chasing everything, every opportunity, every crumb mm. of maybe this could work and I could never really catch anything. So I wish I could say I had a good pivot point that helped me all the way through, but it just didn't like I had really good moments. You know, I, when I was a teenager in high school, yeah. I started doing these teen dances and they worked really well, but only for so long, I could never parlay that into anything. So it was like, it was still chasing the idea of some sort of success that never came. Right. But the, the pivotal moment in my life where I realized like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing is I was on the 405 freeway seven months after moving to Los Angeles from Canada. I had a convertible Sebring. I had a Blackberry for the first time. I mean, these, this is great, right? I had a job that I was, you know, I'll tell you, my wife was making $41,000 as a manager at IBM in Canada. I never made any money because I was losing money in this business, buying this, like it was just a disaster, right? We lived off our salary and we were living in my parents' basement at the time. And I got a, this job offer from NBC for $120,000 a year for a one-year contract. And I was wow. like, oh my God, as soon as I get there, they're going to realize that I have no idea anything about television and I'm a total fraud, but at least I'll get one year. And this is amazing. So we just decided <laughs> to do it, right? Like that was the, we're going to do yeah. that. So I'm seven months in, I got, <laughs> I got my convertible, I'm on the four or five and it's right getting close to the Christmas break. And in, in Hollywood, right around Christmas, there's two weeks, everybody just bugs off and there's the whole town shuts down. Yeah. And so I was on my Blackberry sending like, hey, have a great break. Can't wait to see you when you get back. I got a new shit. Like, you know, we'll talk then, that kind of stuff. And I yeah. realized in this like aha moment that I had more people that I cared about, that cared about me, that I had interactions with on a positive level in seven months in Los Angeles in America than I did in 27 years in my home country where I grew up. And wow. I realized like I had found my people and what I was yeah. supposed to be doing. And so becoming really good that. or exceptional or excelling or working really hard or putting in the extra effort into something that you are meant to be doing that feels right for you and that you find success in is not a difficult process. That is natural. It's the mm. struggle that other people go to when they're doing things that they're not great at, that they're not finding success at, and they're trying to find motivation. That's a difficult process. So I would say that moment more yeah. than anything was like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is where, you know, I'm meant to be. I love that, man. That is so good. It's powerful, right? When you talk about 27 years compared to seven months, right? And I can tell you, yeah. so this is what I heard on that couple of things out of the story was one, hustling from the word go. Like you're not, you're not just sitting on your hands here. Like you're busting it. And and by the way, you must have some sales game. You got a woman at IBM who's happy to marry you and live in your parents' basement and you make right. nothing, right? So don't tell me you don't have sales game, right? Like you, you got something there. Um, and uh, so let's, uh, so real quick, I want to tell you, my background is a little different than usual today. I am on location in Phoenix today at uh, the JW Marriott Desert Ridge here in, uh, in 
lovely sunny Arizona, thank the Lord, because Michigan has been just too cold for too long. Um, so the next part I want to move to, and, and kind of more on this, is that uh, I love the quote from uh, McChesney and Sean Covey, who wrote uh, The Four Disciplines of Execution. Winners, when shown data that they are losing, find a way to win. So let's talk a little bit about your background that allowed you to overcome, become one of the 1%. I mean, you're saying like, oh, man, like nothing's going. You're chasing, chasing, chasing. When were you up against it, losing, and, and just down but not out? Like you found a way to come back and win. What was that moment in your life? I mean, I think the first real big one was the first trip I made to Los Angeles. So you got to say, like, I, I ran bars, nightclubs, lost them, restaurants failed, web design company failed, like lots of that stuff, right? The problem was, is I had this idea for a TV show and I thought it was a great idea. So I just went and made it and spent my own money and borrowed money and got investors and all this stuff, right? And I knew nothing about television and certainly didn't know enough about Canadian television to know that this was a very bad mistake. And so as I was in the mode of trying to find people that would find value in what I was doing, all I found was no's and awful and it was, everything was going wrong, right? And so I was at a point where my parents, my dad actually sat me down and was like, you need to give this up, get a job. Like I had a two-year-old child at the time and, and he was like, it's over, yeah. like, just face the facts, like it's over, go do something different. And I think part of my defense mechanism growing up was this delusional optimism, as I call it when I speak. And this delusional optimism was always like, it's going to be okay. It's going to work. This was really good. This is going to happen. I can make this happen. It wasn't that bad. They didn't mean it. I didn't hear the insult. Like you just, <laughs> yeah. you just, I just glossed yeah. through all that, right? People still actually like yeah. me, even though everybody didn't like that kind of stuff. Like you just don't believe anything other than what makes you feel good. And it's like, that is really a product of an in, sort of like an insecurity trying to protect itself. Right. And okay. so that helped a little bit when things were really bad because I didn't really look at it in a re, in a real sense. I just kind of like disassociated myself from the, from the reality of how bad and how slim my chances were and focused on going forward. Now the problem is, is that is not a recipe for success to be honest. And I speak to high schools all around the country and I'd say like, you cannot follow my, roadmap to success like you were looking at my highlight yeah. reel and you can't get there the way i did it's yeah. a terrible idea but for me the, you know being able to continue to push through and i remember the moment when i came down to los angeles to try to sell the show and people kind of went wild because they had never seen anybody that spent that kind of money on an idea executed it out of such desperation and then also could pitch and tell the idea so perfectly and clearly and what the executives in in Hollywood didn't know is like I had been in living rooms pitching for investment on this show idea that if I didn't get 5000 I wouldn't eat right like so I knew how to pitch this idea I knew how to make people feel like I wasn't desperate because if they smell desperation you're dead in the water right and so that moment where I had met all the and I'm like big managers and huge lawyers and agencies and like, like the, the William Morris agency was signing me on my third day in Los Angeles. Right. But back home, I still didn't mm. have money to buy my return flight home. Like, so when I right. went back home and ever, and you know, my parents and stuff are like, well, where's the check? And I was like, Oh, well, it's, 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 they're working on a thing. And then it's like, well, where's the signed contract? I was like, well, they don't do that. My dad's like, they don't do signed contracts in LA, you know? And I was just like, Oh, and it was like this moment where like I knew that things were different, but I couldn't convince anybody else because it was the same brand with the same hype and the same, I've met these people. It's going to be different now. Right? So that's yeah. when it finally started to work. It was like, okay, like now, now what I do is being valued. Now I'm going to focus and then the hyper focus on that. And that, led me out of the sort of the dark side of what, where I was, you know, in my life there into the light side of my life here and everything sort of changed from that moment. I love that. And because three things that kind of came out there, one is, is your, you know, like 
dedicated optimism, right? It's, yeah. You know, maybe delusional, but it's dedicated, right? It's committed. Yeah. Um, two is you're an absolute pitch man, right? Yeah. Three is you can feel it. Like you can feel, you know, as the success is getting there and how people are reacting to you. Um, let's, let's, let's pivot that uh, a little bit to talk about the superpower that separates you from the others. Catapults you to the 1%. Is it one of those three? Is it a combination? Is it something else? It's, it's mo- I mean, really at this point to get to the level I'm at now, it really was my ability to translate ideas to other people's understanding. I can make people understand mm. my ideas better than, I don't know, than most people in the world. And that yes. where I was in Hollywood is a, an exceptional skill. And mm. because I wasn't focusing on the scripted side of television, so the scripted side of television is more of a is more of an art form to be created, and therefore the pitch doesn't really matter. You either can write or you yeah. can't. So I'm either yeah. buying your drama about a you know a hospital in Chicago or I'm not. It's not that complicated. Whereas on the reality yeah. show side and where I was focused on and the, and the film and stuff, it's like you were painting a world, painting ideas what could happen, what might happen and why it's interesting. And nobody knew if that was going to happen. Right. And nothing you did before said that you'd be able to make this work. So that really required executives to really understand the idea. And then as importantly, be able to convey that idea to their bosses and their bosses to their bosses. Mm -hmm. And so I really developed a system of conveying ideas clearly, concisely, accurately in a storytelling format that allowed people to relay them to others nothing got lost in translation. And then because I was able to do that, more people wanted to take pitches from me. I was able to increase my numbers on how many I took out. They were shorter. They were faster. My tapes were, were easier to produce. Like I just put the numbers on the board. You know what I mean? I just got more at bats because of that. And that statistically Mm. sort of works in your favor. So I think that's the big superpower is simplification. Like I can simplify incredibly complex ideas into a few sentences. I tell a lot of that to clients, right? It's about the reps. It's about getting that chance again and again. Yeah. And it's one of the things in the pro athlete game, right? Like you can't make the club in the tub. Like when you're hurt, like other people are getting reps. They are getting opportunities that you just don't have the opportunity to sit in the training room, right? Yep. And it's it drives me bonkers for, for folks that couldn't take care of themselves, right? Knowing that detail. Um, if you have not picked up audience, if you have not picked up, the three minute rule, you're going to want to get that. He, you know, Brant tells two great stories about this absolute superpower, by the way, where he's working with a, with a person who's telling a, a dull presentation of investors about an oil uh, investment that's possible. And then, and, and then another one where he comes in and saves the day for some engineering. <laughs> yeah. I, went to, with a, I love the, I love the picture that you painted in the book of how many business cards you got. And he, Brant used his pick, his business cards, Flipped him over to, to build basically, uh, you know, a, a whiteboard with his business cards of how he could flow chart his information quickly. And, and within 30 minutes, you may have saved this guy from, you know, the chance of ever getting hired or everyone coming to his workshop again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was like, that is a good one. That was a really good one. Yeah, that's a good, like, it's, it's, it's incredible to hear the, the ability of seeing that, like, seeing that flow of information and how people will take it in and well, i and think it, for that me, for sure it's a super power. yeah well and for me it was like this was a daily event i had to take an idea that we had that was basically nothing and create a full-fledged pitch and we were doing that every single day and so then i'd go work with a company mm. where there's 15 of them in the room they've been working on it for six years they have one product and i was like and you still can't explain it to people like what the hell and so I would break these things down, like, I don't want to say effortlessly, but basically pretty effortlessly. And I'd be like, so basically you guys are a, you know, a a manufacturer of this, like so easily. And they're like, oh yeah. Oh my goodness. I never heard that before. Like, oh, that's so clear when you say it. I was like, okay. Like that seemed pretty easy to me. And because the rest of the world is, is focused on the skills that they do best. That's what's making them successful. And I'll give you a really good example. I 
you know, I was still basically working as a TV producer, but I was taking on some very high level clients to help restructure the messaging of their business. And a lot in the biotech field, because the investment bank that was like sort of really high on me at the time was sort of specialized in that. So what ended up happening is I, I get this, you know, to help this big company and they are working on a type one diabetes anti-rejection therapy drug in stage two trials or some ridiculous thing, right? Literally, I have no idea what any of that is. And they hire me and I'm flying to Miami to go do this. And I'm starting to do all the research because, you know, like I have a real job at the time. So now I'm doing all my research, trying to figure out who they are, what they're doing, why they're paying me so much money, like all this kind of stuff, right? And on the plane, I realized that the, the head of the company, of the scientific side of, this, of the company, the CEO, has a, has a wing of the Miami hospital named after him. And he has methods and <laughs> systems that people, he's a teacher, like it's just, he's, he's one of the most revered people in this sort of pancreatic liver space, right? And I was like, oh my God, like, what am I doing? How is a, you know, shoddy reality producer going to help this? They're going to figure this out. It's going to be a disaster. And as we get there, we meet and, and they're touring me around the, the hospital area where they do their, their, their trial stuff and they're working on the, in the lab and they're like tripping over their diplomas and their accolades are like everywhere <laughs> you can't even and i'm like what am i going to do yeah. but as we yeah. sit in a board room with nine of them and they had to have an extra chair for all the letters after their names right like a whole extra chair just for the letters it was ridiculous <laughs> alphabet <But> within, <laughs> yeah within about 15 minutes it was almost like going wait so you guys don't know anything about anything else other than type one diabetes anti-rejection mm. theory. Like they don't do anything else. They don't do anything else well. And so for for me looking at them, thinking that they're going to be able to pitch and present and create and explain what they do is just as silly as them looking at me, thinking I'm going to be able to help them in the lab with their genomes. Right? Like it's mm. not what we right. do. It's not what they do. Right. And so they found and Camilo found perfect synergy in what he does best, right? He's a scientist in this world. So he found success. So guess what? He writes papers and he makes amazing presentations and he cracks codes on things and he makes inventions and he works all the time. And he's ha like, because that is what he does better than anybody in the world. And he found it and he does it and he mm -hmm. wants to do better. And for me, this is the same thing. I found what I do. I create messaging that is simple and clear and concise for complex companies and people and CEOs that can't explain the value of what they do. And so in some circles, that's incredibly valuable. In other circles, it's like, who cares? But for me and where I am in life, it's like, <laughs> that is what I do best. Well, I love the 10,000 hours described. As you're sitting in the Hollywood producer sheet for those years, You've got every day. This is a I do it. I do it again yes. and again and again. Like, hey, it seem, doesn't take long when all of a sudden I've done this forty hours a week, fifty hour or or more. You know, right. fifty weeks a year, and I've done it for five years. Like, hey, there's your ten thousand hours. Like, this is this is I mean, prestigious level of stuff now that you know, and you're just boom. I can rattle this like yeah. right now, and I, we run into it a little bit in the entrepreneur world. Who says, oh, I'd like to sell my company. Well, I, I've spent forty years building it up, like. Hey, I don't know how to sell a company because all I've been working on is selling and marketing and business right. and making widgets. And uh, so I got to do this one time. Why, why would I spend 10,000 hours in that to do it one time? Like, I just need to hire somebody to do that. So they call yeah. us because, hey, that's a challenge. You know, like, why would I do this? So I love that they call you. And I think it takes somebody pretty smart, by the way, to go, you don't do this. Uh, I don't do this and you don't do this. We should yeah. call Brant. <laughs> like, they don't do. And, and very, very few of them naturally want to go there because they feel it's a deficiency of their leadership almost. As a CEO, mm -hmm. you're supposed to be able to do all of these things, right? And they, there's a little bit of that. And this is one of those elements that they take almost personally. And like, I have a client now who, who, you know, we've had very good luck. Public company, redid the messaging. It's gone very well, right? Mm -hmm. And I still, when I talk to him, he still wants to tell me that he's good at pitching because in his mind, that's, he doesn't want to be not good at something. And I'm right. like, yeah, you, you know, you're great, whatever. Like, 
but <laughs> this is not what you do. You know what I mean? And, and, yeah. Yeah. and I find that all over the place. Like I, you know, it's, it, and you got to look yeah. like Hollywood's wildly competitive, right? Like it's, it's a, it's a sexy sure. industry that people sure. want to be in. It's also wildly lucrative. At the end of the day, I pitch one TV show. You're talking about a million epi- million dollars an episode times 10 episodes. It's a $10 million piece of business in one meeting. So the wow. level of competition for that is overwhelming. So Stagger. I have to take general ideas and go into the head of Fox or the head of NBC, and I get a 20-minute meeting to explain it, and it's millions of dollars on the line. And I did that hundreds and hundreds of times. And people pitching me hundreds and hundreds of times in the same cycle, like I know the rhythm, I know the cadence, I know the I know how to lay out those stories, I know how people feel, they think, I know that they understand stuff. So like I don't do a lot else well, I just do that well, you know. Mm. Well, it's not true, by the way. You do a lot well. You're you're selling yourself short on that. And I know that. So I'm just um, really good about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, also a big thing in Hollywood, right? Yeah, um, exactly. I, I put out a piece this week. I put out a piece this week about you talking the last time we were on the show together, and it was pretty awesome about you know the sexiness of Hollywood and how it goes, and like oh, and I was in the pro athlete game for you know eleven years and all that, and twelve years, and um, and we're all like going, oh man, it sounds so sexy and so good, and you're like going. Man, I'm working, you know, 75 hours a week. And like, tell, tell us the story about uh, when you were when you were doing the pitch, the private airline, and you got like the NFLers on one side going, "We want to be oh, you, yeah, you want to be them." <laughs> like, tell the, tell that story. I love that so, story. It was with the San Francisco 49ers. We had a deal with them to do this show called Stadium Chef Showdown, and it was basically the idea of all the chefs from all the different stadiums showing down each week, mimicking the NFL schedule. And so wherever San Francisco was playing, they would be traveling. And Michael Mina was a a great chef and a good friend, and he was going to be the lead. And we were really excited about it. So we finally got the 49ers to come on board, president of the team, head of business, fly down on the jet, and we picked them up. And when you have a sort of a player in town, no pun intended, but like we stack meetings up all together. So if you're going to fly in for town and you have a big celebrity or, or an athlete or a singer or anybody of real status you stack up all the the meetings with all the networks on the same day so you can just bang them all out and you're done right so we have back to back back to back meetings like five or six so we're in the suv and we're talking about stuff and our first pitch is amazing and we're listening to them talk about nfl in the stadiums and we're just like whoa i'm a pretty big fan i'm a season ticket holder in san francisco and my partner at the time was the biggest green bay packer fan in the world and so we're in the back of the suv and we're like, oh my God, could you imagine how great it would be to work for the NFL? I mean, every Sunday, it's a different team, a whole nother set of challenges all week. You're planning for it. It's win or lose that day. It's like everybody, I mean, it's just the greatest thing ever, right? And we were just so envious yes. of how cool their jobs were, right? Like this, because they were telling <laughs> yes. us all about the teams and everything. And we're just like, oh my God, yeah. how great would that be? Because again, we're fans, right? So after lunch, we got two more meetings and the meetings were good and we met people and, and we're going and, and I can hear Prague and Mori in front of us and they're going, could you imagine how great it would be to work in Hollywood if this was your life? Like going around, taking meetings all day, trying to sell shows, <laughs> taking lunch, strategizing on how to pitch this, <laughs> pitch that. And I remember this overwhelming, like, I don't want to say disappointment, but just kind of like, a oh, I remember thinking like, so the grass is not greener anywhere. Like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Like, you feel like yeah. this too? And it's like, oh, because at the end of the day, and I, I use this all the time, but like, if you have to get up and do this for a living, it's a job. And yeah. the bigger the job, the higher the pay, the better the rewards, the more difficult it is, the more competitive it is, the less you get yeah. to deal with the benefits of what the big job mm-hmm. is. And I remember early, oh my God, early in my career, one of my really, really close friends, his his wife, Dana Walden, is one of the most powerful women in Hollywood, one of the most spectacular executives, you know, chairman at Fox and at ABC. And at the time, there was a new job that had come up. This is years ago. And it was for the president of Fox the Network, right? Big job. And, and she mm-hmm. was the president of the studio at the time. And I asked Matt and I would say, hey, is Dana going to go up for that job? And he's like, oh, God, no, absolutely not. And I was like, what? Why? Why? He's like, it's a terrible job. 
And I was like, terrible job. It's the president of Fox. It's the president of the, one of the best, the newest, coolest network. What are you talking about? And he said, listen, any job that you can get, you don't want. Like, that's the reality. You oh. want the jobs that you can't get, that you're not qualified for. Because all you see are the benefits, mm. right? And in the real world, if you can get it and you're qualified, that's not a great job. And for her, it would have been a terrible yes. job. And I understand that, done that now. You know, I would, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't touch that job with a 10-foot pole. But at the time, it was hard to reconcile that because that would have been the dream job for me. Dream. And she yeah. would never have considered it because she could get it and I couldn't. End of story, right? And so what you yeah, have right? can't have that you aspire yeah. for, you you envision all the beauty and the wonder of it. And it's just like in life when I when I train on high performance. It's just like the house that you think you want. Guess what? You're living in the house you think you wanted five years ago, 10 years ago. And that's the one you dreamed about and mm. pictured your life and all this kind of thing. And like I still do it. You know, I look at a house and go, oh, hey, this is how I would live if I lived in this house. I would use all these things. I would do this. I would sit by the beach. I would have it. And it's like, yeah, right. Except when you live there, it's just your house. When you have the job, it's just your job. You know, Hollywood's mm. just a job. I just made widgets. I made a lot of widgets. I haven't been good at making widgets. Yeah. People like the widgets. Some people didn't like the widgets. Like I didn't, you know, it's like, it's a job. And I'm like, now I'm just so happy to be out of the job. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that right, because it was powerful. Right. The the job that you want and can get is never the job that you no, the job that you can actually get is not the job you want. It's always right. the one step further, right? It's always more. That just makes perfect sense to me. Um Brant Pendedick, we got him online and uh just to remind you, Brant. Um quickly, Brant, tell me about you know, let's, let's talk about that time right before you hit. I mean, things are looking a little desperate, right? You're you're Late twenties, mid twenties, you got a kid living out of mom's basement. Um, you know, things are a little rough action, man. You're married, you're trying to get life started, and you're thinking, man, I'm, I'm hustling and it hasn't worked. What, what would you tell folks? What's the one value, belief, action that you took when you were down that absolutely pushed you through it? I mean, this is tough for me because what I was doing, I can't recommend anybody else do. That's the problem. Because all right, all right, there are two, right. there are two it's not, types It's not going to be doubt. smoke a lot of dope, is it? <laughs> right, no. But there are two types of doubt in this world, okay? And there is self-doubt and situational doubt. And they're very different. And they're very important to understand the difference. And the problem with our society today is we have celebrities and actors and athletes and all these successful people getting on social media and telling you to push past your doubts and don't listen to the no's, right? And what they're talking about is getting you to mm -hmm. think past the situational doubt, which is really the problem. So let me explain the difference between two. Situational doubt is doubt about the situation you're in and the probability of success. Perfect example is you're a restaurateur. And you're wondering if you should open a new restaurant in this particular location. There will be situational doubt you have about that. Is this the right location? Is the traffic enough? Are people going to be able to find it? Will it be able to park? There's all of these things that make this location questionable, right? And once you get into it, there will be doubt about the probability of success. Business hasn't been as good as I thought it was. You know, we're, we are having problems getting people to park, whatever it is. There's doubt about the long-term success of that business because of the things that are happening. Self-doubt is about you. I'm not good enough. I shouldn't open a restaurant. Why will people come to my restaurant as opposed to somebody else's restaurant? I don't really know. You know what I mean? That mm -hmm. is self-defeating. Situational doubt is self-preserving. And you really need to understand the difference between the two. Doubting yourself is just your crocodile brain telling you to be safe. Don't go out there. A saber tooth tiger is going to eat you, right? It's always going to tell you that you're not good enough, that you're a fraud, that other people are doing it better, that you don't have enough experience, that there's no reason why they would choose you. You're never going to get rid of that brain. That brain is always going to talk to you that way. So as you learn to stop listening to that, that's good. But your situational doubt is more subtle. And what happens is if you're Self-doubt is screaming at you all the time and you're listening to anybody, any guru telling you to push past that, you start silencing those 
those voices, including the one that tells you that this restaurant isn't really a good location, that you can't change the tra- traffic patterns. It's never going to work. And then what you do is you mm-hmm. just do it anyways, and you push through, and you spend all your money, and you lose everything because you didn't listen to the situational doubt. And that's what I tell people like today when I'm teaching at colleges or at high schools, like you need a reasonable probability of success. If you aren't already six foot four and a spectacular basketball player, by the time you are 12 years old, you are not getting to the NBA. So you not listening to people who are telling you that is going to hurt you in the long run, right? If you can't sing like Lady Gaga in your teens, you are not going to develop that voice and you are not going to develop that passion. You will not do it. So telling her getting on winning an Academy Award and telling you not to listen to people who tell you no and you can do it. It's like she's one of the greatest singers of all time and people told her no and it was hard for her. So if you don't have that already, mm-hmm. you don't have a you don't have a reasonable probability of success. I opened a large restaurant. I had never worked in a restaurant before. It was a good idea. It was a good location, but I had never worked in a restaurant before. Does that sound like something you should be doing? <laughs> is that a reasonable probability of success? <laughs> no, right? And that is yeah. I mean, we tell so ourselves you ate at today, him, right? Yeah, and it's like yeah. I you got that every yourself, day. Hey, someone I ate them, pitching so me a reality show, and it's like you want to pitch me a TV show. It's like, mm. have you been studying television? Do you? Is this your life? Like, no, you, you saw something on the side of the road. And you thought, hey, this would be a good reality show. Like, are you kidding? Like, no, you can't go do that. That's not reasonable. And it's not safe and it's not smart. And it will put you in a position where you're banging your head up against the wall. And I've seen so many companies come to me with their pitches and their presentations that don't work. And they haven't worked for years. And they keep throwing things into it. And it's like, oh, my God, this isn't about you. It's about the idea and the situation in our society or the tech technology or something that isn't about you it's just not right and you need to listen to yourself when you really do have doubts about is this the right thing pushing past that is not always the right answer no is not always Mm. the wrong answer right i believe that so i want to pivot this on a question from one of the audience members here is that you you touched on it earlier is is the doubt when you talk about self-doubt and situational doubt does does that does that marry a little bit to the imposter syndrome? Because you talk to yeah. that, like, what am I doing yeah. here, man? I'm dude, I'm pitching. I'm the yeah. same way. Like, hey, ten years ago, I was running around on my backyard, hitting the wiffle ball, going Game Seven of the World Series, and now I'm sitting in the dugout coaching these athletes who are all running around the same way ten years before right. that, right? Like, and it's yeah. and the we're living this dream in away the middle from. of it. You cannot get away from imposter okay. syndrome. It is baked into our DNA, and so. What you realize as you get a at every success, level, at every level, and so what happens is, is that every level, every level, you realize that it's like, wait a second, it isn't. You'll never get to be credibility at a level that you'll be comfortable with. It'll never be the right situation. You'll never have enough experience. You'll never, you know what I mean. You'll never be the smartest guy in the room. All of these things. And for me, it was like that when I wrote the book. I mean, there are literally a thousand television producers that have done more, bigger, better things than I have. I could list 10 television producers that could have written this book and had more credibility in the marketplace, right? But at the end of the day, none of them did. I put up my hand and be like, I'm the expert. Mm -hmm. I, I know how to do this, right? And so that is perception is reality everybody understands that but it's like internalizing that as well where it's like okay if nobody else is putting up their hand that's who the expert is and everything on their resume and everything they've done is all a carefully curated version of propping up that perception which is great but the truth is it's like that's the person doing the job at the time right that's the person who stepped up that's the person who said they're going to do it. that's the person who says they're an expert and it's like Surprise, surprise, they become the expert, right? And that's mm. that's the irony of it is like you feel like you're not the person. And yes, Mark Burnett could have written this book. Man, the guy pitches be- yeah. bigger, better shows. He's the, uh, he's the yeah. icon of all reality television. And he didn't pitch the book. He didn't write the book. Ben Silverman didn't write the book. Like they just don't. And now like out of those groups, one of them is a, is the highest level business consultant in the world in this space. And it's like, oh yeah, that's right. That's me because I said I was going to do it before and I just went until I was. And here I am, you know? 
And like so this every is a- single thing I do and train, there's probably somebody else who does it as well in a lot of ways, right? It's just I do it, they don't. And so you push past that. You understand that and you're like, yeah, I, I can do these things. But there are physical limitations. And I say physical metaphorically, which is a weird way to say that, but it is like physical limitations, whether they are actual physical barriers, as in you can't make the NBA, or physical barriers, as in this is not a good location for a restaurant, or physical barriers, as is the marketplace does not value this type of technology anymore. Those are real. And so you saying like, I'm going to be the expert. I can do this. I can make this happen. I want to hang on to this, blah, blah, blah. That doesn't help you at all. Like there's no, you don't have the key that unlocks the lock. So you sitting there with this huge ring of keys saying like, I will sit here. I will go through every key till I find the right one that fits. It's like, yeah, no, that, that lock doesn't go with those, any of those keys. So you're just going to keep trying them and Mm. tell people that you're going to keep trying them. Right. And I have friends that have been doing that for 30 years, trying different things and always, you know, and it's like they just put themselves in situations that they can't win. It's one of the things I honor about you, Grant, and and you know people in our tribe of executives and world leaders, right? And they're the the one percent. And the one thing I love about you, even as I hear you talk about it from the beginning, you know, you're you the guy who says I will. Well, you know, that looks hey, that looks hard over there. You're like I will, I'll take on that restaurant. Like I mean, I know it didn't always work. But you've always been the guy that said, I will, right? And then the book, right? Hey, yeah. you're right. Silverman could have wrote it, right? Like, fine. But like, I will. I, I will do it. And, and by the way, Silverman didn't really have to, right? <laughs> like, you probably didn't either. But like, you know, like, yeah. whatever. I will. I will do it. And I think that says a lot. Um, I, I want to I pivot a little bit to, you, I mean, you, you've had a lot of success. You've won a lot. You've lost. Um, what's the best battle? that you've conquered in your lifetime? I think one of the hardest parts I went through is I got fired from the network. I was running the network TLC. And at the moment, it was a Mm -hmm. big deal for me to get that job. It was a big job. I'd only been in the country for four years. And the, 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 the problem was, is I got the job with big, bold personality and who I was and the way I did things. And my boss, she was very similar to the way I was. And so she was taking over the network. She was new. She was going to shake things up. And I was her number two and the head of development. And I am like a fearless wild man. Like I'll do anything. Everything's possible. You know, no speed is too fast. Like let's go kill it. (laughs) And never coming from the corporate world, I was like, okay, this is my boss. I'm going to support her in every way. Like I'm going to be the greatest at this gig ever from her perspective. Right. And the problem was, is that I was not the right hire. She needed Mm -hmm. someone to, to be the foil for her, to be the yin and the yang. So that when she was like, let's go do this. And someone would be like, Ooh, that's going to be too radical. It's going to, you know, we need to slow down. She didn't need someone being like, yes, you can do it. Yeah, let's do it twice. Why? What do you mean twice? We should do it four times. Why would we do it four <laughs> times? We can do it better. Like that's – so when she got fired and I got fired, it was devastating. Like getting fired sucks. Like it, it's like a coach of a team. Right. Like, it sucks. Yeah. And so yeah. I remember at the time, I think I was number 14 on the Hollywood most important list kind of thing at the time at that thing. And the next day I was fired, I wouldn't have made 1400 And that's the reality mm. of that gig. And for me, it was so difficult to reconcile. And like I had a contract, so they were paying me for two years at full freight. And yet I spent almost the two years like fussing and whining and worried about my relevance mm. in the marketplace because I just got fired. And I remember this mm-hmm. girl who ran Lifetime Network, she canceled lunch. And it bothered me so much because I, in my mind, I was thinking she canceled lunch because I'm no longer important anymore. And she, you know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. You, mm-hmm. you go through these overwhelming doubts. And then the idea that you're never going to get another job. And no one's ever going to like you. And, la, 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 la. and so I think <laughs> coming out on the other side of that and being able to like rebuild myself 
and my ability to feel confident to get out into the marketplace and crush from a personal standpoint, that was the biggest sort of obstacle. Nobody else will be able to tell you this story because everybody's like, Oh yeah, you got fired. And then he got a job. Like no one cared. No one thought twice. No one considered it. It made no difference in anybody's life except for mine. Mm-hmm. I was the only one in, who internalized mm-hmm. that. And I think being able to push past that and being okay with it and being able to talk about it and like being honest about it, like, you know what I mean? Like, cause when people fire, they usually blame somebody else or this, whatever. And it's like, no, no, like I just wasn't the right person for that job. Like it was, you know, and even the stuff I did that worked out was not because of me. Like, so I think that was important. Yeah. And then to, to be able to get on the other side of that and build that reputation again and be like, you know, from my own perspective to believe in it and to accept it, even though nobody else saw it as a problem, I saw it as a problem. Yeah. I love that fall. You know, I think there's that false sense of security, right? With success, especially with successful organizations, like big names. I, I can recall going through this myself where, uh, you know, you're, you're, you put the name behind and this wasn't exactly the scenario, but like if I was Trent Clark with IBM, I knew like, you know, all the vendors were taking the call, but if I was Trent Clark of, my own empower technologies. They were like, who are you? <laughs> like, you know, like when you yeah. said IBM, it was the credibility indicator, right? Like when you said the yeah. learning channel, it was, you know, it was the credibility in here. So do they love me or they just want, they need the learning channel in the office. They don't need brand. Right. Well, you, you have so, to accept that that is part of the, that is part of all of those. Yeah. Positions, right. And like for sure joke in Hollywood that it's like, it's not your call sheet. It belongs to the chair. Right. And there's a great story yeah. about a guy who took over at, at ABC and he sat down and he got, you know, he's looking at his calls for the day from his assistant and it's Jeffrey Katzenberg and Steven Spielberg and you know what I mean? Zucker and all these people. And he's like, Oh my God, this is great. And the assistant's like, Oh, uh, actually that's was the last, that was the last executive's call sheet. Sorry. That's not your call sheet. And then it's like, but all these people called as well. Like it's the same call sheet. (laughs) Doesn't matter who's in the chair. Like, you're mm. renting the chair. It's like the, you know, it's like the manager of a sports team. It's like, yeah, the team's going to play. You do what you yeah. do, but the fans yeah. are showing up next week, whether you're fired or not. Like, and, for sure, and for sure. All the things that <laughs> all the things that the players are going to say, and that the requirements of that job and the perks go with the job. They don't go with you. And so, mm. reconciling that and understanding which things do go with you and which things you can focus on and work on and which things to know that that's just the chair, it's, it's hard to do. It's very hard to do. So I love this question. Um, and this is kind of going back to your, you've got this great self-awareness now for sure. I mean, this reflection, this reconciliation, right? And yeah. you've got um, this work with these 1% executives. When you, the question is, when you look in the mirror, what is it something that you see like right away and then everyone else might not see that about themselves. Like it's, it's obvious because you see, you know, it's just like kind of when you see this, this flow chart of information and marketing, you know, people in that spot that are going to that 1%, like they're struggling along the way because there's one thing right in front of them and they don't, they don't, even, they're like, they don't know what's there. You know, I find now and what I spend a lot of my time in, in the world now is like, they don't see joy they don't see Mm. joy in their life beyond the four walls that they're in at the moment and i ask my coaching clients it's like are you experiencing the maximum amount of joy you can be in your life on a day-to-day basis now who answers yes to that nobody right have you have you maxed out the capacity for joy that you can feel okay it's like why is that not a function of your goals or things whatsoever? Nobody talks about that. That's what they want to do. And like I shifted into that mode a couple of years ago and it's, you know, it's been amazing, blah, blah, blah. It has cost me in a traditional sense. I don't take on as many clients as I could. There's a million things mm-hmm. in business as I could still be doing. I mean, I could be doing so much tv and shit right now and and so it has cost me in those areas because i've focused more on spending the capital metaphorically and literally that i've acquired over the years 
as opposed to trying to acquire more. And mm-hmm. I, I see that at the highest level. And the people who operate at the highest level is like it requires a level of dedication to the goal that leaves everything else out. Right. And, but the problem is, is that they can never get through the goalposts. Like they never can find success outside of that. And so when I see what I do, it's like, okay, I'm filling my life with more joy, almost on a, like I'm learning the skills to do that. And when I see other high level executives, I was like, wow, you don't have any of those skills and you don't even work (laughs) on those skills. Right. Right. You're great at running a company and you're a public company CEO and you're amazing at, but the ability to manage life for the result of joy is the same process. You manage a company for the result of profit. Why do you want the company Mm. to be profitable? Uh, It's just because that's what, that's the upside of doing things well. And in life, doing it well should bring you joy. And the more you do, there's like the profit on your company. That's the, that's the profit in your life. And I think that's the hardest people thing for people to, to get their head around. And if you look at like, I just left Los Angeles and for the next six months, I'm just driving around the country in an RV, meeting people. Like I don't take on new clients. I'm not yeah, trying to sell ROI on that. <laughs> there's no ROI, like except for personally, right? Joy. And yeah. yeah. And it's like, because I've already seen it. I've already been there. I understand that like I've had, I've made money that I don't spend. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's a weird phenomenon where you make, it's nice to make more money than you spend, but it's also like I'm working harder to make more money and I don't even spend that. When am I going to spend that? It's now at the end of the bank account. Like it will never, I will never spend some of the money that I've made over the last five years. And that's weird. Like that's a weird thing mm. in our society. And that's a weird thing in culture. Yeah. Like, that money literally will never get spent. That's just insane. And so why is it there? It's there for security to make me feel good. Because I think what, at some point I'm just going to not be valuable in the world today. Like, I don't understand that. And I, when I, you know, I train people and a lot of times it's on exits, selling companies, getting out of companies, what to do next, blah, blah, blah. And it's sure. like, you, if you are a successful person, if you have found a niche, if you have done well, if you're a go-getter, if you make things happen, if you put things together, if you're a packager, if you're a producer in life, you can't get out of the way of money. It will find you. It will mm. seek you out. It will chase you down. It will get to you. And your life, people listening right now, is a clear and complete validation of that statement. If you are 41 years old and have a job, guess what? money just keeps finding you. You move to a different job. You move to a thing. It just, it, it works, right? Most people, when they find success, life works for them. And whether they move into something else, and like that's the way life will be for you. So that's yeah. been a big shift for me is like, I just do what I want to do in the pure sense of, will this enrich what I, my, my joy levels? What I appreciate about your joy levels are, and you didn't hit on it, which, you know, I find them infectious when people have that joy. Like I see people wanting to be closer to it. Like they want to go, Oh, can I get some of that and move <laughs> over closer to you? You know, almost like, can I touch the cloak? You know, <laughs> like I just want to, can I touch cause I'll be healed and get some joy. Right. Um, so, for, so I want to end with this. I want to say thank you. First of all, Brand, for coming on. I know you're busy and traveling the world here. I know our listeners will see the value and everything today. The three minute rule, the, Man, all these stories are so good. There's so much value here today. I can't take it. But um, let's let's. It's time for the best way to win. Is there something that you want to share with the listeners that we did not touch on today? Anything that you're thinking? Best ways to win. One of the things that a key element for everyone to know. You want to go to be elite. You're headed that way. What's the one thing they just have to have to win? I think the idea that if you to win and to be sort of better is to not look for shortcuts. I think that the, Mm. that is the hardest thing for people in today's world that are on the up and coming side of things because they see success. And I think social media is a perfect example. They see people with a million followers and they're like, great, I'm just gonna make a funny video and then I'll have a million followers. And Mm -hmm. that is the shortcut mentality. 
is that they don't see the layers of what it takes to be an influencer, what it takes to create video content that that particular audience will engage with. Like there's a process. It's very difficult. The world is a very competitive environment. So when you look at the end goal and when you think I can get there faster, easier, and take a shortcut, most times you're going to end up going the longer way. And the discipline it takes to do things right, to do things the proper way, to do things and put the time and the energy in will actually train you better to be able to move faster and have it feel like you're taking a shortcut. And I think I I learned that so late in life. And I got so lucky that I was the way I looked at trying to take shortcuts in life and, and, and use my abilities to get from A to B faster or skip, you know, in in the way that the, the success from A to Z, I skip as many letters as I could. I, I probably in life was at a 95% failure probability. Like most likely I should have not made it because where I was, where I was living, the things I tried, the way of my attitude, all of those things, I just got very, very lucky. I found a specific industry at a, and by the way, at a specific time, you know, reality TV was just kicking yeah. ass. So yes, it's like all of those things happen in the right, perfect conflicts. You do not want to live your life and pattern your business, hoping for the miracle moment to thread the needle. Like it's just not what you want to do and you don't need to hard work, dedication, you know, people who do the extra, go the extra mile. You can't get out of the way of success. It will find you. I love it. So prior to the show, you winners find a way on YouTube live and many more videos on the leadership channel. We are at Leadershipity on Instagram and Twitter. You can also find me at Trent M. Clark. Of course, my handles are both those on all social media and our website, leadershipity.com. Brant, where they can find you again? At Brant Pinvidic on any of the socials and LinkedIn and all that or brantpinvidic.com or 3minuterule.com. Love it. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please continue listening. Great win, uh, winners find a way. Five stars. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, we work hard to deliver value delivering stories from 1% leaders for you every episode. Uh, we're going to finish with your quote. Um, rough times. Did you ever have a quote like your go to? Like, man, like I, I woke up. You know, a lot of us had posters on our walls when we were kids, man. I'm like 51, right? So I was like, I had like the Bo Jackson. I had some things on the wall. But was there a verse or a quote or anything that you can say that you always have a go to? <laughs> It's terrible and it doesn't mean anything, but there's a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger called Conan the Barbarian. And it was yeah. a pivotal moment in my life where I was a small, young, prepubescent boy dreaming of being a giant monster with a sword that could use strength and virility and violence to solve any problem right like when you're 12 years old like that seems yeah. like the greatest thing and feel like that when i when i hear this quote and they're asking what is best in life and everybody says some stupid thing and conan says to crush thy enemy to see them driven before you and to hear the lamentation of the women and i was just like that's a that's what a barbarian would say with a sword as he chops down you know and that for some <laughs> mean like when i feel small when I wake up and I don't want to do stuff, it's kind of like, I'm, I listen, I always joke, I'm one chromosome away from being a caveman, right? Like that's the ego okay. side of things for me. The like, that's what gets me rolling. It's like, I think about in my loincloth with a mm. sword someday. Perfect. Brand, this is my quote for the day because I honor, man, that you just pivoted in a, in, in not a perfect child and facing adversity uh, Winston Churchill, some people dream of success while others wake up and work hard at it. And, you know, as I listen to your story, man, you've been a hustler from the word go. You weren't sitting on your mom's couch with Cheetos wife, you know, wife went to work. <laughs> hey, come on, man. Like you're trying to, the tech company, the, this, the, that, like eventually success was going to find you because you were willing, like you were willing. I will. You were the guy that would say yeah. it. So I, I really find that so admirable about you, and I always appreciate it. Every time we talk about it, it just comes to mind right away. Like, you can't hold a good man down, and that's it. That's right, brother. So, that's right. 
Sing it. So for everyone, thank you, Brent. Um, appreciate you have being on the show. For everyone else, thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next episode, Winners Find a Way. Uh, we do this every Friday, 1230 Eastern, 930 AM Pacific on the Leadership at Eat YouTube channel. Brent, thanks again so much for taking a break today, man. Anytime, brother. Thank you for joining us for another Winners Find a Way show. I am your host, Trent Clark. If you love this episode, share this episode with your friends and Follow us on whatever podcasting medium you're listening to. If you want more content from us, join us at leadershipity.com or the Leadershipity YouTube channel. You can find us on all the social media networks at either Trent M. Clark or Leadershipity. For our award-winning workshop, Win With Great Teams, you can find that page on LinkedIn as well as our corporate page, Leadershipity. If you want to win more It starts with you today. Say it with me now. I have what it takes.